Bonjour, je m'appelle Karen Jensen. Et je Hi, suis... my name is Karen Jensen, and I am the federal commissioner to the uh, a Equity and also your animator and host for today. It's with pleasure that I welcome you to the first public assembly on pay equity, and I thank you for taking the to time to with, be with us. Let today. us quickly go over a few little housekeeping details. If you encounter any de technical issues, click on the technical support link at the top right of your screen. To access floor audio options, which are bilingual or no interpretation, click the floor audio button at the bottom left below the video window. Simultaneous interpretation is offered on both the English and French feeds. You can change between English or French by clicking on the language button at the top right of your screen. Sign language interpretation is available by clicking the ASL or LSQ button below the video window. ASL is available on the English page, LSQ is available on the French page. The interpreter will appear in a separate pop-up window that can be resized or positioned anywhere on the screen. You can submit your questions for the question and answer portion of the event, and I hope you will, by typing them in the Ask a Question box on the right side of your screen. So, now that everyone is up to date on the functions of the web platform, I will also provide you with a, a summary of today's agenda. We have the honor of having Marie-Thérèse Chicha with us virtually today. She will kindly provide some opening remarks. For the next item, I'll provide you with a short summary of my report uh, looking back on the year of 2021. Following that, I'm excited to facilitate a 30-minute fireside chat. We're honored today with the presence of Katie Ward, Ontario's Pay Equity Commissioner, and Denis Clat, owner of Clat Conseil en Rémunération. Finally, we'll proceed with a question and answer period. So, without further ado, let us begin. For everyone who is attending today, your presence demonstrates your commitment to pay equity. Having spent many years working in this area, I know how challenging pay equity can be. But as Maria Shriver says, and I, I paraphrase here, recognizing the importance of pay equity means that you recognize the importance of telling women that their work is valuable. It means that you recognize the importance of reducing the persistent gender wage gap. Your efforts and expense involved in this exercise will pay off, I can tell you that. But as you know, aside from the business and moral imperative, there is now a legal imperative to undertake pay equity in all federal workplaces. One year has passed since the coming into force of the Pay Equity Act, which means that organizations are getting down to the business of, for example, creating pay equity committees, putting together job classes, and maybe you're even calculating compensation. Whatever stage you're at in the pay equity process, I applaud you for your efforts. I hope that as you do your work to create a pay equity plan, you'll keep in mind what I call the three C's of pay equity success, communication, collaboration, and compromise. Experience has taught me that when people communicate openly, and are willing to compromise and collaborate, they're much more likely to avoid time-consuming and costly conflict. This will greatly assist in meeting the three-year deadline to develop a pay equity plan. La session d'aujourd'hui a été développée en Today's pense. session was developed in, uh, by thinking of you. We know that you work hard to understand, understand the legislation and to implement it in your workplace. We know that it is not an easy task. And for this reason, we have with us invitees that are very special and will give you advice and concrete ideas based on numerous years of experience in pay equity. On that note, I'd like to now introduce our first guest, Marie-Thérèse Chicha, for some opening remarks. 
Professor Shisha holds a PhD in economics from McGill University in Montreal. She is no stranger to the world of pay equity, and we're very honored to have her here with us today. Professor Shisha was a member of the Bilson Task Force that recommended the proactive pay equity regime we now have in place. She's also written an article comparing pay equity regimes around the world. Madame Shisha, thank you so much for joining us. Merci beaucoup, Madame Jensen. Uh, je vous remercie pour cette invitation. Uh, Thank you, Madame Jensen, for your invitation to address, to talk to the Assembly. So I will try to present in a few minutes some precisions that I have based on research that I've done. Of course, pay equity seems like a law that has a very positive impact on workers. It tries to eliminate the discriminatory wage gap, which is an important milestone on the road to equality and which allows many women to escape econo economic insecurity, both in the short term and in the long term. For example, in terms of retirement payments, uh, benefits that are based on pay. So these are two important monetary aspects, but we often forget that there are positive spin-offs for, for workers and, empl and employers to this reduction of, the, uh, of pay equity. So if we, if we look on the side of workers, realization of pay equity will show the complexity of the work that is done in the, in the companies. By showing off these requirements, often it shows off their, their efforts. It takes an, evalu an evaluation that is not sexist. We need to show the richness of these jobs. It could show off the prestige of these jobs that are often considered with disdain or being simple jobs without many responsibilities. So it, it will bring more prestige also for their uh, masculine colleagues, ma colleagues. It shows off the complexity and the real contribution of these jobs and the profitability of, uh, of these jobs. So it's very important for workers in these, in these companies. We need to show the increase of costs once we've analyzed the pay equity. We have diverse employers and looking at the results of the research, we see that there's important benefits for employers. The first benefit is the coherence of the system of pay. Often the system of compensation was constructed based on certain changing criteria. For example, if we so hire someone who is close to the directors, it will affect the pay that is offered to them. And it causes also lack of certain specialty jobs. For example, there's some jobs that are masculine dominated that have a more power of negotiation. So it is often hard to manage. Some managers, some managers have said that it's not a simple job, but after having done this exercise, they had a pay system that was a lot easier to manage. 
and which is great for new new workers. So that's an important benefit. The second benefit is the reputation of the company. We know that young workers are sensitive to the ethical aspect, which is in the workplace. A company that has done pay equity and that has the reputation of having salaries that are equitable and conform to the law is an important advantage to attract young people, especially when today there's a big lack of uh, workforce. The third benefit is the improve, improvement of the uh, work relationship. In the case that is a committee of uh, pay equity, the employers and the representatives will work together for a common objective. So it replaces often the conflicts uh, in work relationships when there's uh, when they're discussing work agreements. This will influence also the exchanges between representatives of the employees and and other representatives, and it will have a lot of benefits. And if we talk, so that's one of the good practices. So there, there are not only three, there's another one as well. So why is it a good practice? Because it can bring about the requirements that are often forgotten and have a better conformity to the law. At the same time, employees have more confidence in the results and are more inclined to contest them because the representative will already have participated in the exercise. Second good practice is good training of those that need to actually enforce pay equity. And there's a technical aspect because you know that pay equity is complex on a technical point, but we can't also forget training based on stereotypes and bias. And so that's also part of the training that that should be uh, done. The last good practice that I will talk about is transparency. The representative of the employees should also participate in the in the exercise of pay equity. So training on salary, on social social benefits, it should be done. It was a study a few years ago on union, on the unions, and we realized that more commissioners, more information was complete, complete and precise. It's quite important. So I tried in this short presentation to show you a few elements that I find important, especially in terms of pay equity. I want to highlight before finishing that it is necessary to be vigilant because gains uh, are sometimes very fragile, especially in these times when the economic situation is very changeable. We must not allow economic turbulence to erase the progress we have worked so hard to achieve. It is the responsibility of all of us. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Shisha. I wanted to take the time to thank you for your encouraging remarks. Now, uh, I would like to turn to uh, our, our presentation at this point, looking back at the year of 2021. And to begin with, I'd like to make two important acknowledgements. First of all, I'm grateful to the people of the Anishinaabe Nation for the privilege of being able to live and work on their unceded traditional territory, now known as Ottawa. And secondly, I want to acknowledge with deep gratitude all of the work that members of the Pay Equity Unit, as well as members of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, have put into making this first year, after the coming into force of the Act, a really productive one. As I highlighted in my first annual report, which I presented to Parliament on June 22nd, the team of dedicated pay equity specialists with whom I work 
and have work, uh, and have the privilege of working with have worked hard to produce tools, educational materials, and efficient processes which will make compliance with the Pay Equity Act uh, less difficult. For the next few minutes, I'm going to highlight some of the key points from our first annual report. And I invite you to consult the agenda on the Town Hall registration page for a link to the annual report should you wish to review it later. Also, I'd like to point out a small error in the annual report on page 13 in the English version and page 15 in the French in reference to the coming into force of the Act. The text should read that the Act came into force in, in August of 2021 rather than June 2021. This error is being corrected and a new version will be online as soon as possible. Passons maintenant au rapport. Le cadre du rapport correspond. The frame of the report co uh, is conformed to the mandate, which was given in conformity to the uh, Article 104. Article 104 stipulates that the commissioner to pay equity must take care of the implementation of the law and give help to employers and employees and the negotiating agents based on the questions and the demands of pay equity and decide on all questions that uh, on the law and also develop tools to promote conformity to the law and mobilize and inform employers and employees and the negotiating agents and after that publish research work and I need to maintain a, a link with the organizations in the province. I will now highlight and summarize what we've done as work to accomplish our mandate. In monitoring the implementation of the Act, our focus has been on applying a proactive compliance model to assist employers in fulfilling their legislated responsibilities and duties under the Act. So, so what does that mean? It means developing and maintaining a collaborative relationship, working relationship with employers through regular open communication. So rather than seeing ourselves as the disciplinarian intent upon catching people who are violating the act, our approach begins with the assumption that most employers want to comply with the act and need our assistance to do that. The important thing to stress here is that we're promoting and expecting compliance from all federally regulated employers, not just the biggest and most visible ones. One of our goals is to reach the small employers who tend to fly under the radar and ensure that they have the tools they need to comply and that they understand that compliance is not optional. To that end, our first role in monitoring the implementation of the Act has been to ensure that employers and other workplace parties are fully aware of their responsibilities under the Act. Our second role in monitoring the implementation of the Act involved the development of guidance as well as a template for the notice informing employees that the pay equity exercise was going to take place. So that's that first notice that went up in November of last year. Another way in which the unit has been monitoring the implementation of the Act is by participating in the development of regulations to provide detail about the requirements under the Act and to set out the administrative monetary penalty regime. The second part of my mandate is to offer assistance to employers, employees and bargaining agents to resolve matters in dispute, complaints and objections and to process applications for authorizations under the Act. Our role in resolving disputes and processing applications under the Act is to provide feasible options and resolve the issues in a timely manner so that the workplace parties can meet their deadline of three years for establishing a pay equity plan. Our approach emphasizes the need to communicate, collaborate and compromise. This includes helping the workplace parties to resolve their own problems by providing tools and information and, where needed, an efficient alternative dispute resolution process. 
The team has worked hard with me to develop procedures for resolving disputes. So for example, we have a team of skilled mediators who are very knowledgeable about pay equity to assist in expeditiously resolving disputes. If we're unable to resolve disputes, we will use the investigative and other dispute resolution powers available to us under the Act to render decisions. An important part of assisting parties to resolve disputes is to provide timely information. It is our belief that if you provide timely information, you can avoid many of the, the uh, controversies and conflicts that can develop during pay equity processes. So we've developed a process for triaging requests for assistance and information that ensures that the appropriate resources are dedicated to each request and that the responses are rapid. A request for information form is the single point of entry into the pay equity unit. And people have asked us why. Why are the complaint forms not up on the website? Why is the uh, authorization request not up on the website? Well, having one point of entry enables the pay, the pay equity unit to tailor its intervention to the needs of the party making the request and to avoid unnecessary expenditures of time and resources. There may be a way in which the, the team can assist to resolve the matter before it becomes a formal complaint or a formal matter in dispute. Cela m'amène à une autre question importante dont nous avons discuté dans la... That brings me to another important question that we talked about in the annual report. So that's the demands of uh, authorization. A key characteristic is that the commissioner to pay equity can authorize in some circumstances a modified application on um, pay equity. An example would be many plans of pay equity. As you know, the law has one plan per employer. However, the law gives me the discretionary the discretion to have many plans in appropriate the circumstances. The third aspect of my mandate is to develop tools to promote compliance. The pay equity legislation is complex and it affects different aspects of an organization's work systems, such as classification, job evaluation, and compensation. And it can have an impact on collective bargaining, workplace culture, and employee involvement in compensation decisions. So for that reason, employers and pay equity committees need the right tools to help them navigate their pay equity responsibilities. Some of our key accomplishments from the last year include the pay equity compass, the pay equity toolkit, videos, infographics, uh, and many others. And you'll find those on our website. The coming into force of the Act on August 31st, 2021 provided an opportunity to engage in an extensive public education campaign. For example, I participated in a joint Facebook Live event with the Minister of Labour at the time, the Honourable Philomena Tassi. Since October of 2019, the Pay Equity Unit has participated in 89 events to share information about the new Act foster engagement and increase involvement. I also appeared before the Standing Committee on the Status of Women in February of 2021 to testify about the pay equity legislation. And I have been active in the Equal Pay International Coalition, known as EPIC, as well as other international networks, such as the UN Global Compact Network. I spoke at an Equal Pay International Coalition forum held in Berlin uh, in February of 2019. EPIC is led by the International Labour Organization, UN Women, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Canada is recognized internationally as a leader in pay equity, and it was an honour to share insights with other countries about how best to achieve pay equity. The Pay Equity Unit engages the majority of its public audience through our online platforms. We use our various social media channels, particularly Twitter, to promote pay equity in both official languages, to drive traffic to the website, and to address commonly asked questions. 
We also use social media to amplify key messages about pay equity and the work of our provincial counterparts and, par and partners. In addition, we've published and continue to publish an enormous number of resources about pay equity on the pay equity section of the Commission's website. Many of you here today have helped us through the tripartite working group to develop these materials and for that we are truly grateful. Our goal is to collaborate with you, our stakeholders, to make sure that you're getting what you need to get the job done. Another part, important part of my mandate is to undertake and publish research. We recognize the importance of making sure that our interpretation of the Pay Equity Act is consistent with the Canadian Human Rights Act, and in particular, the addition of gender expression and identity as grounds of discrimination. So together with members of the non-binary community, we conducted research, developed, and published a document about how to promote gender inclusivity into the pay equity process. It's available on our website under Tools and Resources. During our consultation with stakeholders, we also learned about the challenges that employers are facing regarding the establishment of their pay equity committee, especially when multiple bargaining agents are involved. So we developed research to address the, the issues of collaboration and consensus building in committee structure and have, an, have published a number of promising practices on early engagement in the workplace, forming a pay equity committee, collaborative decision making and consensus building. And these are not uh, uh, simple documents, They're, they provide great detail and insights on those important issues. Finally, my mandate uh, requires that I work with my provincial pay equity counterparts, including both Ontario and Quebec's pay equity commissioners, to coordinate efforts. I'm happy to say that today we have collaborated with both Ontario and Quebec pay equity commissioners to develop training materials and to engage in education campaigns. I am so grateful for the generosity and wisdom of my provincial counterparts who have helped me and my team enormously in the early startup phase of implementing the Federal Pay Equity Act. So I'd like to thank you now all very much for your attention to this uh, year in retrospect and for taking the time to review our annual report. I'm really happy that it's now time for us to shift gears and to turn to the fireside chat component of our agenda. I'm very honored to be here today with two special guests for our fireside chat. With me, I have Katie Ward. Katie is Commissioner and CAO of Ontario's Pay Equity Commission. She was appointed Commissioner in August 2020. Before joining the Commission, she implemented aspects of Canada's federal feminist international assistance policy focused on engaging women in the labour market and economy. Also with me, Denis Klatt, expert pay equity consultant and compensation principal at Klatt Compensation Cons Consulting. Excuse me. Monsieur Klatt has over 20 years of experience consulting in the field of compensation. His academic background combines finance, human resources and statistics. In the past, he has been invited by the CNESST to provide his opinion on the implementation of the Quebec Pay Equity Act. Thank you both so much for being with me here today. To open today's discussion, I would really like to hear from you a little bit of an overview of the proactive components, in your case, Commissioner Ward, uh, of the Ontario pay equity legislation and Monsieur Klatt with respect to the Quebec pay equity legislation. Commissioner Ward, if, if you would begin, please. Sure, and thank you very much for inviting us to participate. It's wonderful to, in this forum to share our experience. Um, the Ontario legislation is actually a hybrid model combining both proactive elements and a complaint-driven model, but I'll focus on what's so interesting with the proactive piece. Um, I'll just sort of start by saying that the, the Ontario Act applies to both public and private sector employers above 10 employees, and it requires um, them to go through a pay equity analysis, which includes a gender neutral job evaluation uh, process, uh, and all of our, our methods are outlined in our Act. 
um, and to really understand and value equal pay for work or equal uh, pay for work of equal value, which is pay equity. But I think what's important is to share with the employers and with, with uh, our stakeholders here is the underlying principles behind the creation of the Ontario Act, which made it proactive. And one of the principles is that um, the onus exists on the employers for them to provide for pay equity. Um, it, it should be a self-managed process. So that's number one. Number two is that unions are fundamentally important to the process and the, the Act outlines the roles and responsibilities unions should take and also notes that pay equity plans should be a part of the collective agreement. Um, another principle that the Act is, is based on is this idea that legislative oversight is likely to be more effective if parties have the ability to resolve disputes amongst themselves and to come up with solutions amongst themselves. So this is a, a, an approach I know we share with the Federal Pay Equity Act is that we allow for parties, uh, collective bargaining agents, employers, whomever the parties may be, uh, to come up with a solution that best suits their context. Um, finally, you know, the, the, the fourth principle I'll share is that government intervention should really only be when the parties cannot come to a resolution. So in our case, um, we can step in and have review officers uh, go through the pay equity process with the two parties um, to arrive at or to facilitate the creation of a plan or we can respond to complaints from either of the parties or a complainant. So we have that sort of complaint-driven hybrid model at the end, but again, our, we put the onus on employers to be self-managed, to engage with the unions if it's applicable, or all parties to find the solution, and then come to us if that's not uh, feasible, and we can work through the solution. That's great. Thanks so much, Commissioner Ward. To you now, Monsieur Klatt, can you talk to us about the Quebec legislation? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, Commissioner Jensen, thank you very much to let me uh, participate in this public assembly today. Um, as for the, uh, the Quebec's pay equity legislation, it came into force in 1996. So we passed from a complaint-based system to a proactive uh, pay equity act. It covers all workplaces or employers or 10 employees, uh, 10 employees or more. And uh, as the other legislations, it covers uh, public to private sector organizations. Now, general rule for that pay equity is that uh, the same as the federal, on the federal side, it's one pay equity exercise or pay equity plan per employer, per enterprise, mm -hmm. per organization. But there are some exceptions to that, of course. And also the requirements vary by size. So for workplaces of 10 to 49 employees, Employers have to assess the compensation systems and verify whether wage adjustments are necessary. For the 50 employees to 99, 50 to 99 employees, the employer needs to put in place a pay equity plan, which is basically a series of sequential steps that are manda mandatory under the Act. So, for example, the first step is to determine job classes and their predominance, so male, neutral, and female job classes, uh, need to be determined at this first step. Then once this is done, it's to determine the value of work, specifically for the male and female job classes. Then we have to calculate the compensation of each job class, and to finish, we have to compare, we compare the, the compensation of female job classes to the one of male job classes. And if there are adjustments towards uh, incumbent female job classes, of course, uh, corrections need to be made. Throughout the pay equity plan process and also the pay equity exercise for the employers below 50 employees, uh, they need to uh, do some postings. Okay, so postings enable employees to better understand and to comment the pay equity uh, exercise, and it uh, lets them also file complaints to the CNESST if necessary. Now, that's for the 50 to 99 employees. The 100 em employees and over. They need to put in place the same pay equity act, uh, the same pay equity plan. Sorry, but it needs to be done by a committee, a pay equity committee that includes representatives of the employers and of the employees, of course. Once this is done, once the first exercise is finalized, the employer has the obligation to maintain pay equity in the workplace with a 
pay equity audit that needs to be completed every five years. There are also uh, periodically uh, declarations that need to be filed on uh, the realization of uh, pay equity obligations in each workplace. So we can say, if we compare a little bit the Quebec's legislation with the federal legislation, we can say that in general, the Quebec's legislation is less prescriptive than the federal one in general, and especially for the 10 to 49 uh, workplaces, 10 to 49 employees' workplaces. But there are also some other differences between the two legislations in terms of the delays to complete the first pay equity exercise, or in terms of which employees are covered under the Act. For example, on the federal side, executives are covered, but on the Quebec side, they're not. And this is a real important difference between the two uh, statutes. Uh, there are also differences related to the requirements during the pay equity maintenance audit uh, and so on. But despite all these differences, we still see that uh, both legislations and all three legislations, mm -hmm. in effect, uh, follow the same guiding principles and follow the same uh, goal, uh, which is to, of course, proactively uh, put in place measures to uh, redress compensation differences uh, related to uh, systemic gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And they all do follow the same basic steps in the exercise, yes. in the pay yeah. equity exercise. And I think for some uh, employers who have been involved in pay equity for a long period of time, that's somewhat reassuring in that, you know, it's not a whole different process. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you determine job classes, you determine gender predominance, then you evaluate the value of the jobs, mm -hmm. you add up the total compensation, you calculate whether there's any gaps in the compensation between jobs uh, that are predominantly male and jobs that are predominantly female of equal value, and then you pay out the adjustments if need be. So it's the same process in, the, um, in all three pieces of yes. legislation. But as you say, Monsieur Clat, there are, there are significant differences. and. Uh, and there are significant challenges involved in, in all three pieces of legislation. So I'd really like to turn now to that issue and, and share, uh, if you could, with the audience some of the challenges that, that have arisen with the implementation of, first of all, the, the Quebec legislation. How, how has that challenged employers and other workplace parties? And how have, have those workplace parties overcome those challenges? Yes, so among the different steps to complete a pay equity plan, determining the value of work is, without any doubt, the most challenging step for pay equity committees or employers when employers realize the, the pay equity plan alone. And there are different reasons for that. Well, first of all, the statutes, so uh, I'm, the, the Quebec statutes or the federal statutes as well, uh, require to use the same job evaluation method to evaluate all the job classes that are covered under the pay equity plan, okay? So if we're in a workplace that has, for example, different bargaining units or a workplace that has um, different job evaluation systems for different groups of employees, a decision needs to be made on one single method to evaluate the requirements of all the job classes that are covered under the pay equity plan. So this in itself is a big challenge because in some places you have, you have some, some compensation systems that are built on those, uh, on those job evaluation methods. So that in itself is a challenge. Second reason why uh, job evaluation, job classes evaluation is a big challenge for committees and employers, is that despite all the efforts that I put, that are put forward to make job evaluation objective, so the use of job descriptions or questionnaires filled by employees and so on, job evaluation remains inherently subjective. It is always to some extent based on judgment and influenced by percep perceptual biases uh, of, the, um, of the evaluators. Now, 
Of course, some actions can be put forward to limit the level of subjectivity of job classes evaluation. For example, as Madame Shisha mentioned earlier, to adequately train the evaluators on how to, to, to uh, complete a proper job evaluation analysis in a pay equity context. Uh, also, uh, to apply a structured methodology to ensure the accuracy of the information that will be used to support job evaluation and the consistency when rating the different job classes at the different sub-factors of the job evaluation questionnaire. Or also, uh, employers and, and pay equity committees can uh, consider using um, gender neutral point bands to limit the impact of, subj of subjectivity on the pay equity results. Um, so the, the, uh, all these measures will not, uh, will not uh, completely eradicate uh, subjectivity from the process, but they will certainly, we hope, limit the level of, uh, limit the level of subjectivity and increase the reliability and procedural justice of the whole, uh, of the whole exercise. Now, another challenge I would like to raise today for the guest is within organizations uh, above a certain size that still manage compensation on a more um, on a more uh, discretionary basis okay so no salary structure or, or uh, bonuses awarded on a case-by-case -case basis in those workplaces usually the logic behind compensation attribution and compensation progression is not based on uh, clear and consistent guidelines throughout the workplace. So when it's time to complete a pay equity plan and to compare the uh, requirements of, uh, not the, the requirements, but the compensation of female job classes with the one of male job classes, it is subject to more inequities, which translates into usually more pay equity adjustments. Mm -hmm. And this is not to mention the cumbersomeness of, of exercises in those organizations that is increased compared to other workplaces that are more organized on a uh, compensation uh, standpoint. So for these organizations, and I'm not talking about the very small uh, workplaces with very few uh, job classes, but above a certain size, it is recommended whenever possible with the pay equity deadlines because as you said, uh, the, it's three years and uh, they, they, are, they have like two years, most employers on the federal two side have left. two years yeah. left. So whenever possible, Implementing a gender neutral salary structure and when necessary also maybe um, framing the other comp compensation components in, in policies prior to completing the pay equity plan will help, well, it will facilitate and improve the pay equity plan uh, in terms of, of cost, in terms of process, but also in terms of reaching the pay equity goal, which is to, uh, to correct differences in compensation related to uh, discrimination on the workplace. That's very helpful. Thank you, Monsieur Klant. Commissioner Ward, have you got uh, some, some ideas of some of the challenges and, and ways that employers have overcome those in the Ontario context? Sure, and because as Monsieur Klatt has already mentioned, our acts share so many similarities in terms of the process and you've outlined the process. Uh, much of what he's mentioned in terms of the technical application of the act is, is, is very real. Um, and he's mentioned some great solutions, but I, I want to step back uh, and, and talk about the, the initial challenges back in the 1980s when Ontario implemented the Pay Equity Act, um, which is and still seems to be is the sort of perceived challenge employers have in implementing pay equity and the impact that that might have on the bottom line. And we, st we, we still face this challenge and that, uh, this objection. Um, and part of my counter conversation is always, but what you don't see is the the cost of the bottom line to not doing this in terms of the um, the talent acquisition costs when you're losing talent, you're not able to attract uh, top talent because you're not paying or compensating individuals um, effectively or because you're not um, recognizing and compensating ideas fairly because they're delivered by a woman. But in 1985, uh, we published a green paper that was leading up to the creation of Ontario's legislation. And that, that paper um, rightly identified the cost to business, but what it also identified 
uh, or predicted was the incredible social and economic impacts that pay equity would have. And now, you know, 37 years, 37 plus years later, we have ample evidence to demonstrate that what was predicted in terms of internal benefits to a company, in terms of some of the things we've talked about, talent retention, engagement, uh, innovation, all of these things has been realized on the internal level, on the external um, level in terms of the, the economic growth that's been realized. So boost to GDP because of women's salaries increasing, which spins out into the economy. So there's micro effects for women and family lives, but there's also macroeconomic effects in terms of the spin out in the greater economy. At the same time, when the act was published, um, General media response was positive, so that helped to overcome the challenges in terms of the employer's perception. Um, the media were, in general, praising the purpose of the act. Obviously, they had some criticisms, it's, it's quite normal, uh, of some of the aspects of the act. But, you know, at the moment in time when our act was, was created and passed in the 80s, this was a moment, an interesting social moment, where women's equity movement was dominating uh, social conversations. And so we had this grassroots groundswell, a domination of women's equity conversations in, in the social atmosphere, and then a unique coalition government that had the political will to do this. So I think in any case, we know that these objections of cost or the objections of fear of diving into this um, have been met and overcome by the social and economic impacts that we've seen and uh, the social and political will to actually achieve pay equity for women, uh, not just across Ontario in our, in our case, but also now across Canada. That's very interesting and, and quite encouraging. Thank you both for your, your very specific comments on the, on the challenges, I appreciate it. And now just one final question that I'd like to put to the two of you. Um, and and this, is, um, this is based on the long experience that you've both alluded to in, in the provincial regime. Um, you know, you've, you've had the time to go through this with, with your clients, with, with the people that, that come to the commission. Um, so you've seen these challenges. What advice do you have to give now to federally regulated employers who are just starting out on this process? And, you know, how can, how can they not repeat some of the mistakes mm -hmm. that may have been made in the provinces by companies in the provinces? What can they do to, to get ahead of the situation and, and put their best feet forward? I can start? Yes. Uh, this is a very practical piece of information, but, um, or practical piece of advice, but, you know, more often than not, we see that employers and bargaining agents do not keep good records. And so, you know, keep good records in three separate words, keep records, make sure they're good, and just make sure you're recording. Um, and so this means keeping your, your job descriptions, uh, job ads, um, any sort of a job evaluation system you may have internal or compensation structures that you've alerted to that you already may have in place. If you're working with collective bargaining uh, agents and you come up with an agreement or you negotiate something, make sure it's documented, make sure both parties sign the document and it's kept. Um, because you'd be surprised how much we run into when we're doing pay equity analysis, just the, the lack of records that makes it very difficult. So uh, that would be a number one. In the Ontario case, um, we don't legislate maintenance. It's, it's, as I said, as part of the proactive aspect is that the onus is on the employer and it's a self-managed process. Um, so it's wonderful your acts have that, that laid out in time and I think that's an important piece to remind employers is that to, to schedule this and to have it as a part of your uh, human resource planning that you're looking at and maintaining, which works well with your, with your good record keeping. And uh, last thing, um, maybe less practical but very important is learning to undercover uncover your unchecked biases because the pay gap um, as many of you said and we don't we you've already said in your opening remarks we don't assume that employers are intentionally creating pay gaps they exist because there's larger structural issues in the way that we've structured the labor market uh, that we've structured the way we talk about work and the way that we have over time created a sort of gendered work, uh, working space. So I think it's, for leadership, it's incumbent to challenge themselves to think about their biases and how that may be impacting the way that unintentionally or beyond their leadership prior to them, um, these structures have been set in place unintentionally. That's really interesting. One, one example that I sometimes give to people about that is the expectation, for example, that, that an admin assistant 
will, even though it's not part of her job description, clean up after uh, a meeting has taken place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, one questions whether or not that would be expected of, uh, you know, a male uh, counterpart in, mm -hmm. in that situation. And, and one questions whether or not that requirement to clean up after meetings would be valued as part of the, the job evaluation process. And, and if it's not formally recognized, right. but expected, mm -hmm. um, you know, what does, what does that say about the biases that we may bring towards uh, the value of, of jobs that are done by men and women? Exactly. What are your thoughts, Monsieur Clat? Well, in terms of P, to, to give guests a piece of advice, I would say the first one would be people uh, often underestimate the time it takes to put in place a pay equity plan. One reason for that may be that um, lots of employers think that or believe that because they have a salary structure in place or a compensation policy in place and because they do not intentionally hire women at lower compensation rates mm -hmm. than men, that their workplace is gender neutral and that the discrimination doesn't concern them. The problem is that systemic gender discrimination is not only about intentionally paying a woman lower than a man in a job or, 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 or between jobs. Um, this kind of discrimination is, is usually uh, unconscious. Mm -hmm. It is hidden in the compensation systems. It is hidden in the market data that is used to build those compensation systems in the job evaluation processes, in the job evaluation tools, and so on. So the pay equity legislation requires employers to look at compensation with a new pair of glasses. And it's often when people start digging in, or the committees and the employers, uh, I talk about the employers and, and committees who put in place their pay equity pl plan, when they start digging in the different steps of the pay equity plan, that they realize that their workplace has some uh, discrimination and that it's not as gender neutral as they thought. So implementing a pay equity plan is a long process. Mm -hmm. When you need to do it with a pay equi equity committee, it gets a lot longer. And also on the federal side, if we take into account the, uh, the request of the federal side to uh, to, um, to, to determine the predominance of job classes in an inclusive manner, well, this requires additional time that needs to be taken into account when scheduling your pay equity uh, mandate or the, the time it will take to complete pay equity. So for most organizations, I recommend not waiting a few months before the deadline before uh, until they start their pay equity plan. And even for for, for, for some organizations, depending on their, their size and their context, some should start their, their pay equity plan uh, very soon, if they haven't already, or at least starting getting prepared for it. Now, if I may, there's another piece of advice I would like to give the guests today. And it's in relation to how organizations manage compensation in between pay equity exercises. So, Often what we see is that once the pay equity plan is implemented in the company, in the organization, all right, the uh, organizations toss it away and just get back to it when it's time to complete mm -hmm. their pay equity audit, which is basically for five years later. Okay, it is required five years later, but there are many years that separate like the, 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 the initial plan and then the next phase, which is the pay equity audit. So. In those workplaces, and when, when the, uh, in between the, 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 the pay equity exercises, when there are new compensation decisions that need to be taken, they're not necessarily validated from a pay equity perspective. So when it's time to complete the next pay equity maintenance audit, what happens is that uh, management has no choice but to notice after the fact mm -hmm. what impact, and after the fact, but often also many years after, um, what impact those compensation decisions have had on their compensation gap, which will most probably uh, translate into retroactive payments over periods of many years. So this represents additional financial costs for organizations, for employers. 
And these financial costs could have been avoided or at least planned in advance if management had uh, validated the impact of those compensation decisions throughout their years, uh, validate the, their impact on pay equity, the same way that usually those decisions are validated from a cost perspective and from a budgetary perspective before they're being uh, taken. So whenever possible, uh, I would say that it's, it's, uh, it's a good idea to, to start considering um, integrating pay equity validation on an ongoing basis in the compensation decisional process. So this will help weigh the pros and cons of those decisions uh, throughout, the, the, throughout the years. And, and it will enable management to, uh, as well, to, uh, to either reconsider some decisions or adapt them instead of the decisions becoming accomplished facts that will entail uh, unpredicted and, and sometimes significant financial costs. That's very interesting. So you're saying then, Mr. Clapp, that employers should be keeping pay equity in mind throughout uh, pretty much all the time whenever compensation decisions are being made? consider the impact on pay equity? Well, it's, it's a way, and I think it's a gain-gain situation because we've seen it like uh, with, in the past uh, with pay equity in, in Quebec. And when you go, for example, you complete your pay equity plan five years later, and you have to notice what impact a decision you took four or five years ago mm -hmm. have on your pay equity, well, there are retroactive payments. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about decisions as little as trying to or deciding to to uh, hire an employee above the salary structure and let him him letting him progress uh, without boundaries above the salary structure or big decisions as uh, putting in place an incentive plan for a specific group of employees so if if these initiatives are not validated from a pay equity perspective proactively well, again, once after a few years, they become accomplished facts, and, and you just have to correct what, uh, what effect it had on your organization from mm -hmm. pay equity uh, standpoint. I think that's very practical advice. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your insights. Um, and I would like to turn now to uh, the question and answer component of our agenda and uh, provide an opportunity for those of you uh, that have joined us and haven't been able to submit your questions online yet, uh, to do so in the um, Ask a Question portion of, of the website. Uh, but we have received uh, some questions that were submitted through the registration form. And <clears throat> so we will um, proceed now to, to look at some of those questions that we received from the registration form. Uh, the first question that we've received is, who is covered by the Pay Equity Act? Uh, so that's a, that's a really important question, and it's multifaceted. And I, I would uh, like to take this opportunity to point out to our listeners that we do have on the Pay Equity website what we call the Pay Equity Compass, which uh, helps employers and employees and unions to determine if the Pay Equity Act applies to them. Uh, so I would, I would just direct you first of all to that, um, and also to the Act itself, which under Section 3 does set out the, the definition of uh, employee. What it doesn't spell out as clearly is that temporary, casual, or seasonal employees in the private sector are also in included. Uh, in, in the definition of employee. And uh, those individuals who are employed um, by a federally regulated private sector employer um, are, are included. So that's um, railways, banks, telecommunications and broadcasting companies, uh, uh, interprovincial ground transportation, air tra air, airlines, um, and, and the like, uh, so uh, federal crown corporations like Canada Post are also included. Uh, so employees of those organizations are covered by the Act. Now the, the question often comes up um, as to whether or not a dependent contractor is an employee or not, and that's a, a thorny question that arises in, in many different uh, contexts, not just pay equity. Uh, so many of you employers have experience uh, grappling with this issue. So you have an employee who's on contract, 
uh, does that make them an employee per se under the Act or are they in fact an independent contractor and not subject to the Act? So in that, in that context, what we, uh, what we would recommend is that uh, the Pay Equity Act, um, being human rights law in general, um, is subject to some of the common law tests for uh, employee, for the definition of an employee. And, and in distinguishing whether someone is a dependent contractor, you look to the, the common law tests which the courts say should be given a liberal interpretation uh, because of the fact that it is human rights legislation that we're dealing with. And those, those uh, common law tests uh, tend to look very much at, at the issues of control and dependency. And so they ask, you know, to what extent is this uh, dependent contractor or this contractor uh, dependent upon and controlled by the employer? Um, and so while you may think that you have a contract of employment with this individual that is, um, it, you know, it is, it is an independent contractor relationship, it may be that according to the common law test, you actually have a dependent contractor who is then subject to the Act and who must be counted as an employee. So those kinds of questions can be quite tricky and technical, and uh, it is good to consult with um, with a lawyer uh, for assistance with that, but we also do have an interpretation policy guideline on the definition of an employee that we have on our website that gives you more detail in terms of those common law tests, and you might want to have regard to that. So the, the second question that we received is addressed to Monsieur Clat, uh, et c'est en français. Donc la question est la suivante. Quels so sont the question les... is the following. What are the factors of the evaluation of the uh, categories of job categories? Are there, are there uh, similarities with the law on, on uh, pay equity? So there are four categories of factors that are covered under each evaluation in the pay equity. So we talk about planification, planning. We talk about efforts and the conditions in which the work is done. So whether it be the federal law, whether it be the law of Quebec to answer the question, it's very similar at that level. Also, the same, the factors need to recognize the characteristics that are being studied. So the masculine and, and feminine characteristics of the exercise. I talked about subjectivity earlier. I was mentioning how it's an issue and the risk with subjectivity and the sub factors to evaluate jobs. There's the risk of under evaluating certain jobs as the results of the evaluations have an effect on pay equity, if the jobs are not evaluated effectively, what happens? Either the results uh, do the, uh, create uh, a, the fact that we don't respect the law, or sometimes there's uh, they defavor the masculine jobs. So it's the question that we have right now with the choice of factors. We can do plans that can be developed uh, specifically for the employers and the federal side. There's the CNESST, which has plans for smaller employers. And there's plans with many different sub factors and working conditions. And the federal side as well, there are, there's a such tool. But if we are in workplaces, we need to recognize characteristics. It's recognizing sub factors to these big categories that will really present the workplace where the employees work. I appreciate the uh, answer, Mr. Clab. It's now uh, let's move to our third question. But before we do that, I'll ask my team if we've received any questions in the chat. 
from from uh, our listeners? Yes, we we have, and uh, perhaps both Commissioner Jensen and Commissioner Ward would like to respond to the question. Um, so the question is, what policy law would be required to roll out the Pay Equity Act beyond federally regulated organization into the private sector to ensure all Canadians are protected with pay equity? Great question. Um, well, the, the Federal Pay Equity Act obviously applies to federally regulated employers, and I think it's important um, in this case to to mention that pay discrimination is covered and counted by uh, human rights law, so the Ontario Human mm -hmm. Rights and Federal. So mm -hmm. I think there are remedies already for for women or um, regardless of your gender identity, any person occupying a job class that may be categorized as female, and if they believe that job class is being discriminated against, um, they can have a remedy under the human rights uh, and be able to make a pay discrimination. In fact, we've had a, a major case um, in Ontario, the uh, midwife's file, that didn't, they didn't come to the pay equity office. They didn't use the Pay Equity Act as a remedy. They used human rights pay discrimination as a remedy. Um, and so that has raised the profile of pay equity in the conversations. And I think it's demonstrated how important equity is in our country when, at least in Ontario, federally regulated employers across um, Quebec, and there are other provinces that have pay equity statutes for just the public sector, um, that that there's multiple remedies for women, that women can come through a pay equity statute or they can go through human rights pay discrimination. That's a, that's a very good point, uh, Commissioner Ward, that human rights legislation in general mm -hmm. protects against discrimination yes. on the basis of gender. And so there is a remedy available uh, to someone in a province where there is no pay equity act mm -hmm. through the human rights legislation. I guess what what distinguishes that kind of legislation and that kind of remedy from what we've been talking about today is the proactive nature of the right. legislation that we have in uh, the three in 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 Quebec, Ontario, mm -hmm. and uh, now federally that applies to both private and public sectors, in that it doesn't require a complaint. So exactly. employees uh, who believe they've been subject to discrimination on the basis of gender. Uh, in their pay in a province that doesn't have this kind of legislation have to complain. Whereas in our jurisdictions, they don't have to complain. The onus is on the employer to undertake the pay equity exercise regardless of whether they think they have a problem mm -hmm. or regardless of whether their employees indicate that there's a problem. So right. that that is, is what is different. And, uh, you know, it is to be hoped, I think, that uh, other provinces will follow suit and uh, and many provinces as you say um, Manitoba being one example does have pay equity legislation that applies only in the public sector but it's hoped that that will eventually apply mm -hmm. to the private sector and that the other provinces such as British Columbia that don't now have any pay equity yeah. proactive pay equity legislation will adopt it seeing that it is uh, it is advantageous not to put the onus on on individual employees right. to bring forward a complaint. So let's move to the next question, which is um, the following. Could you provide some information about the authorization request process for multiple plans? Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to launch into that. Um, and as, as you all know, as a rule, employers must establish a single pay equity plan for all of their employees, no matter the branch, division, or region in which they may work. This means uh, that employers must have a single, a single pay equity committee and a single method to value the work across all job classes from entry level to, uh, to executive. Uh, so establishing multiple pay equity plans is an exception to the rule. Um, it also means that a pay equity committee must be constituted for each of the pay equity plans. Uh, so establishing multiple pay equity plans with multiple pay equity committees uh, being an exception to the rule is also a challenge in the sense that uh, it does mean that there are numerous committees doing this work that can be challenging. However, 
under certain circumstances, the Pay Equity Commissioner, which is myself, uh, will approve applications where the parties can establish through evidence that it's appropriate under the circumstances to do so. Um, and they have to show that it is consonant with the purpose of the Act, which is to redress gender-based discrimination in the pay practices and systems of employers. So the criteria for uh, those, the, the decision to grant multiple applications is set out in sections 30 and 107 of the Act. So an application for multiple plans must include the number of plans proposed, a rationale for how multiple plans would be appropriate in the workplace, and a list of the employees covered by each plan. Uh, in addition, the workplace, the, the workplace will need to demonstrate that the plans include a sufficient number and range of predominantly male job classes to allow for a proper comparison between female predominant and male predominant work. And, and that's really important and it's, it's important that uh, employers understand that uh, bargaining units uh, for example, if a, if a pay equity, if a proposal is made on the basis of bargaining unit structure, uh, they really have to pay attention to the extent to which there is a sufficient number of male comparators and a sufficient range of male comparators to allow for a proper uh, pay equity study to be done. So for more information on the factors that will be considered when assessing an application for multiple pay equity plans, we would ask you to refer to the Interpretation Policy Guideline document on multiple pay equity plans that's on our website. Um, and uh, for more information, you can also uh, uh, put questions to, uh, to our, our team in the chat, and uh, they can be addressed also to, um, to our open, uh, our, our mailbox, and to me or any of our other speakers. So um, are there any other questions now from, uh, from yes. our audience? Yes, we did receive some questions. So the first one uh, that I'd like you to answer to is where is the toolkit that you have spoken about? <laughs> so <laughs> they can only find the toolkit on the Ontario webpage. So where, where um, people can find the toolkit for the federal uh, Great question. Really happy that you, you uh, submitted that question. So we would ask you to go again through our single port, port of entry, which is a request for information, and indicate that you would like to be part of the pilot study of this, uh, this great tool kit that's been developed. And that will be sent out to you with instructions and it will include the job evaluation guide, the user guide, um, and sample data to allow you to, to run the data and to, to try the, the tool out. Then you can use your own data uh, and, um, and, and use the toolkit in that way. The reason that we're doing it this way, it's what we call a soft launch of the toolkit, is so that we can get your feedback on how it works mm -hmm. for your particular enterprise because we are still refining it to ensure that it is as accurate as possible and that it, it meets the needs of small to medium-sized businesses. So again, um, if, you, if you go through the request for information uh, button on our website, we will get back to you very quickly uh, with the toolkit. I understand there's another question from the audience. Yes, there is. So the second question um, is the following. So how do we manage associate uh, identifying as non-binary or not identifying their gender. Um, and a sub-question would be how to define jobs, predominantly male or female, in today's gender self-classification? Yeah, that's a great question and uh, that was um, something that I alluded to in my remarks that we recognized that we needed to interpret the Pay Equity Act in accordance with the Canadian Human Rights Act, which does include uh, gender identity and gender expression as a prohibited ground of discrimination. So what we have said in uh, an IPG on our website is that employers should consider 
collecting data from their employees in a safe and responsible way that allows employees to identify their gender identity and their gender expression uh, in a way that is non-binary so that they will have an opportunity to indicate whether they identify as male or they identify as female or they choose not to identify and, and consider themselves to be gender fluid. Employees should then be given an option to choose whether or not they want to be included in the pay equity exercise as, as male or female. Um, and, you know, recognizing that that may present issues uh, for, for some folks who, who identify as non-binary, uh, then putting themselves in the situation of, of having to identify as male or female uh, may be challenging, but nevertheless, the way that we uh, worked out the conundrum around the gender binary nature of pay equity is to say, give the employee the opportunity to make the choice uh, and to say whether they identify, uh, it, whether they choose to be identified as male or female. And the, the, um, the, the gender binary, non-binary uh, folks that we spoke with in consultation uh, in, in developing this policy indicated that uh, in, in very many cases, gender non-binary folks feel as though they have been the subject of discrimination and discriminatory pay practices in similar ways to the way that women have have been over the years and so being able to identify even if you are uh, even if you identify as as male being able to be included as a female in the um, in the gender predominance uh, in, in the determination of the gender predominance of the job class is an important option to to give people recognizing um, the historical discrimination that gender non-binary folks have experienced so Again, if there is an opportunity um, for you to go to our website, you will you will will see the IPG on that. I'd like to also invite uh, Monsieur Klatt to to give us and uh, and Commissioner Ward her thoughts on this because I know in in both jurisdictions this is something that uh, folks have struggled with as well. Commissioner Ward, would you like to start? Uh, sure, I'll actually start by thanking you, the Federal Pay Equity Commission, for the. Um, internal policy guide because we've referenced it. It's a great, great document. Uh, we, we get the same questions because the language of the act is, is binary. Um, and when we, you know, we've, we reviewed this and had conversations about this and it's because the act was created to redress the historic discrimination against women in certain job classes or rather the historic devaluation of women and women's work. Um, which has roots in women being clustered into certain types of jobs and then those jobs being devalued primarily because they're held by women. So there's a lot of complexities there. When it comes to the issue of gender identity, um, we like to remind individuals and employers that the act applies to an individual regardless of their gender identity. So if somebody is occupying a job that um, is being discriminated against because it's perceived to be a female job class, or it is a female job class, um, then the, the discrimination is, is happening on, on that job class because, because it's been classified or historically or stereotypically predominated by women. So we like to remind individuals that irrespective of their identity, we have had men uh, apply or compl make complaints under the act because they're in a female job class and feel that they're being discriminated against. So the act applies to individuals, but it does require the, um, at the, the job classification system, the identity in order to determine whether a job class is predominantly male or female. And that's where um, I think your approach is very helpful in encouraging individuals to think through that because if the, if the discrimination is happening based on gender identity, then to identify in such a way that you could make the job classification system work in terms of understanding where you are in the pay band and where the, what is the gender of the job class so you can see, seek um, proper accommodation through the act. Thank you. Mr. Klatt, your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's, I think in 2022, <laughs> it's really important to address yeah. this situation in the society. And, and I think it, it, it's really, uh, I, it's really a big, uh, 
I wouldn't say it's the next big, uh, uh, how could I say that? Challenge. Uh, well, it is a challenge, but it, it, on both sides. So what happens is that it's important to recognize, as you both said, uh, gender identity and gender uh, expression in 2022. Uh, and it's not a new thing in, sense, in the sense that we, we speak about it more than ever mm -hmm. uh, these years, but uh, it's something that exists since uh, many years. Mm -hmm. The only thing that we need to be careful about is to make sure that um, it causes to, we have to make sure that, for example, in the pay equity legislation, we have to be careful to make sure that it doesn't cause uh, harm, I would say, or mm -hmm. prejudices to uh, incumbents in female job classes. So mm -hmm. what I was saying before, uh, I was thinking about that, as important as it is, when you, uh, you're in an organization, for example, and the employer hires you, the goal of pay equity is to make sure that um, there is no, uh, to, to, to counter systemic gender discrimination mm -hmm. and to make sure that uh, th there are to reduce or to uh, eliminate the disparities uh, towards women in, women in female job classes. The question, and it's more a philosoph philosophical mm -hmm. question, is when we talk about gender diversity okay, and gender identity, in a pay equity context where we want to verify if the, um, if, if the employer uh, exert, well, exerts actually uh, discrimination in his workplace, we have to make sure that it, by, by, by asking incumbents to identify themselves as a non-binary or, or, or male, a man or women, that it doesn't go, I would say that it doesn't uh, jeopardize, I could say, maybe I don't know if it's the right word in mm -hmm. English, mm -hmm. but um, the goal of pay equity. So let's say you're, you have a, a, a job class with one incumbent, okay? And let's say that unintentionally or intentionally, okay, because it happens, but the employer, when he hired somebody in this job class, he perceived that incumbent as a woman, okay? And he practiced or he, 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 he when he gave the compensation, it has some discrimination inside, okay? And then, for example, it's a job class with only one incumbent. And then you go with uh, the, the, the inclusive manner of, of determining male and female job classes, and the incumbent is non-binary and decides that, uh, for example, for the exercise, or, or, or the incumbent uh, has a gender identity uh, of men, like a male gender identity. So he identifies himself as a male incumbent, all right, and, and that's okay. But then, in terms of pay equity, this job class, if it has only one incumbent and there's no stereotype and there's no historical incumbency, so that's just an example, well, this job class may become a male job class. But the goal of pay equity is to correct differences in compensation due to the systemic gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. If in that case, the employer hired the employee perceiving that person as a woman, and then he, he discriminated in the salary, and then on the other side, while well, the job class is considered as a male job class, well, then this job class will not be entitled to pay equity adjustment, but most of all, it's going to be a comparator for, all, for other job classes, female job classes. So if it, it includes discrimination, you take a job class that includes discrimination as a comparator for other female job classes. So that's just an example, and it can apply on different sides. But I think that's just something, I think we have no cho choice but to address this new uh, this, this situation. I would like to point out on that one, and, and then we're going to have to wrap up because we're, we're out of time, but the, at least in the federal legislation there, uh, the way in which gender predominance is determined is based on three, fa three mm -hmm. criteria. So it could be that the current incumbent is, is identifies as male and therefore it's male predominant. But if the stereotype and the historical incumbency yeah. of, course, of that yes. position Same. have been female, it may well be decided by the Pay Equity Committee that in spite of the fact that there's a male incumbent in that position, it is a female mm -hmm. uh, predominant yeah. job. Yeah, it's more so, in cases where there's no stereotype and no true, historical incumbency that, yeah. that it, it creates yes. some 
yeah. mm -hmm. and be good with you, I would yeah. say. So I'm, I'm really sad to have to, to end our discussion here, but I really think it's important to respect our audience's uh, time limits. Donc je veux remercier tout le monde pour ces excellents. I would like to thank everyone for those fantastic questions. If you have any other questions for my team and I, please do not hesitate to click on the uh, information request form on our website. And also happy to answer questions. So to reach the Ontario Pay Equity Office uh, or Monsieur Clat, you can refer to information that we will present on our website. And um, and you can you can reach out to those individuals. I also want to reassure everybody whose question was not answered. And I always find that incredibly frustrating when I have a burning question, and the panelists never got to it. So I, I want to tell you uh, that your question will be answered. Uh, we are going to publish on our website um, or make available to you in alternative format if necessary the answers to all of your questions. Um, and uh, so, so do not do not worry about that. So, uh, for for some final points that my team would like me to underscore before we say goodbye, uh, the team is in, is developing a podcast series about the experiences of the transportation sector with implementing pay equity, um, and and we'd love to thank the guests who have agreed to participate in that. Uh, it's been it's been tremendous to work with the transportation sector to ensure that we have resources um, in the form of podcasts that deal specifically with their industry. And we'd like to extend an invitation to organizations from the rail and air industries to also participate in that. Uh, and if if you are interested, please contact us, and we can include you in the development of podcasts that are specific to your your industry. And I'd also like to let you know that the team is working on creating a space for you to continue some of the conversations that we've started today. Uh, in short, we'll be testing out the benefits that uh, industry-specific communities of practice may bring to you uh, for the purpose of sharing best practices for implementing pay equity in your workplaces. So um, contact information for this initiative will be shared with you in an event package. So one last thing, before you log off today, a window should appear on your screen with a satisfaction survey, and we'd greatly appreciate it if you could take just a few minutes to fill it out. It'll help us to improve our future events. Donc, lorsque vous quittez uh, la session... So when you will leave today's session, a window will pop up and invite you to complete an appreciation survey. We would be delighted if you would be able to take a few minutes to answer this survey. It would help us to improve our future events. Thank you again. Uh, we really appreciate your, your participation in today's event and we wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.